ready to be wowed? Yeah. It's important stuff. Okay. So we're going to go over contracts. What do I have? About 20 minutes? Yes. Okay. I want this to be as interactive as possible, so I'm not up here jabbing. So um, I'm just going to dive straight into it. I want to point out five of the contracts that you're going to be dealing with most of the time. And our first one is called Master Sales Agreement, or for some of those who have been around, like myself, they're also known as Pi Agreements. These are our standard contracts. So this is where it's tiered. It's based upon a percentage off, based upon how much volume a school does. Does that make sense? So if a school bills, I'll use Concord as an example, somewhere around $1.5 million, then to $2 million, you get 42% off list. This is a contract that you will deal with with your um, SAM, ISAM, and with your manager. There's no PD involved, this is straightforward, and this is most of um, the contracts that we deal with. Right now, as you probably have heard, these are under review because a lot of these are being expired at the end of the month. So you'll be getting probably notifications from your SAMs or from your managers to get those updated. Um, a digital contract or ebook contract. This contract here can entail with your, if you're doing flat book, uh, flat rate uh, ebook pricing. Uh, it could also be anything to do with your digital homework. So let's say if you have a contract that you need to put together for flat rate ebook plus a um, add MindTap or if you need to just do flat MindTap, these are also a contract that you'll deal with. This again, SAM, ISAM, and manager. No PD involved. Uh, the next three is where you'll need your PDs. So a market share contract. How you would come, uh, what this is, let's say that, um, I'll use Vista, because this could be a, a good play here, where we're trying to go after some new business that we've never had before, and we want to take this program and take that program. So it's a vertical play for two. So we would put those under contract stating, we're gonna, you're gonna give us the business for these two programs for X amount of years. And usually you'll need to bring in your PD on that because there's going to be some kind of transformational deal in there of the way that those courses are being designed or uh, worked. Statement of work. Chris Cummings went over that um, just a few minutes ago, but that is also where you'll need to bring your PD in. So if you're starting to work with the curriculum project, it's been scoped out, statement of work, you'll work with your PDs and your SAM on that. And that is basically an agreement between Cengage and the school, stating this is what Cengage is agreeing to do for your curriculum, and this is what the school has said, yes, this is what it is. So you don't come back at the 12th hour and someone says, wait a minute, you said you're gonna do this. So those are important. Um, the last contract type is course fee model inclusive. Anybody have heard of this? You guys went over that with Jerry earlier? Yes. Okay. Again, PD. So what you'll do here is once you hear this, you'll work with your SAM or ISAM or those inside. Sorry, I forgot my Clifton Park crew. Um, and your PD right here will take the big lead on this. So I just wanted to kind of briefly go over the type of contracts. So there's questions on any of these. You've got brief descriptions in your take-home material if you need a refresher and who to work with on each contract type. Okay, so how do you get started on a contract discussion? There's a few key things if you haven't gone down this road that I think is really important to know. And you need to know when the decision's being made, how many units are we looking at for a particular program, when is the school making the change, and our books and tuition. That's a big one, if the books are in tuition or not, based upon what kind of contract we can look at. Um, and the reason for these questions of knowing this information is to make sure that you're really going into the contract, that, that you do need a contract, because you may or may not. So make sure you have these kind of questions. Um, and who, the who is very important. Who negotiates? Who makes the textbook decisions? And who is in the, on the committee? We had a situation um, how about four or five months ago at Concord, for instance, where somebody was thought that they were in charge. <coughs> and 
you know, we kind of went down that rabbit hole, came back out of the rabbit hole, and well, lo and behold, that person did not make that decision to sign that contract. So we've kind of been talking to the wrong person for a while. So always ask those questions of who, who is going to sign this contract? Because if you're talking to the wrong person, you've just wasted your time. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah, I think sometimes with that, you know, it seems a little forward to, to do that, especially when someone's coming off as they're being, they're, they're pretty important, you know what I mean? But it's just going to save you time, and I mean, then you're not wasting their time either by asking the direct questions. Contract, it is this, um, I mean, like, cause I know Bob signs ours, but what, what do you mean, like, a person that's going to give it stamp of approval and give to the finance team yeah. to sign it, right? Exactly, because there are a lot of times you might be talking to somebody, even at the VP of academics level, but the CFO is going to sign off on that contract. So if that CFO is not brought into the conversation very early on, then you start hitting objections because the CFO over here has got <coughs> a laundry list of questions that have not been addressed because it wasn't important to this person over here. So typically I find out who's going to sign this because I want to make sure that those questions are being asked and being addressed from the very beginning instead of having to go backwards and things stall. So. Did you ever use previous contracts to identify the client? Yes. Yep. And most of the time, what I have noticed, uh, especially in our newer territory, is the CFOs that are signing those. So I try to make a point to find out who those people are just when that happens, so that way we know. Good question, though. Anything no. else? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Why a contract? Any any ideas? Why? I mean, I've got some of them up here, but. Exactly. Dan? Yep, those are good. Um, I do this a lot for a vertical play. Anytime that I want to go in, I don't try to go after one or two books. I mean, I want the entire thing. Melissa knows that about me. I don't want two or three adoptions. I want the whole stinking program. Um, competitive purposes. This is another big driver. Sometimes you put things under contract too. If you find out that your business or um, a competitor is coming in and being aggressive, so you'll put block things down in the contract there as well. And just it overall keeps everything sticky. I can, you know, we're going to do some curriculum work at Vista. Get that done and done. I can go work on something else now because I know that's going to be locked down for probably two or three years. So Chris doesn't know that yet, but it's coming your way. <laughs> um, creative contract making. As Chris was talking about earlier, you don't have to necessarily, there is not a X equals Y equals Z kind of formula. Be creative with your contract making. You can do things where I have. I think probably the wonkiest contract that I did is where I had a competitor coming in trying to take my dental assisting away at Concord. And what I ended up doing was putting them in contract that we would give them $70 for any existing student in their program to buy that book, but they had a roll to the new edition, and then there was going to be a steeper discount there, but that was locked down for three years. So that kept my competitor at bay and kept my customer happy because their program is in a wheel, so it allowed the students uh, that they did not have to pay for another book, and the school purchased those new editions at a cheaper cost. Um, you can also tie in multiple courses or programs, kind of like what we talked about with the market share. Custom and digital is another big thing. I have a you know contracts for loose leaf um, place that I have where I've been able to help my school who has books out of tuition. So that's also been you know beneficial. So basically, what I'm trying to get at is with your contracts, look outside of the box if you're looking for something creative. So, and I know we talked on the phone that you had some crazy contracts. Is there anything that you wanted? Yeah, so I mean, as our contracts are, are coming up, you know, I was looking at some pies that we had, and it could have been something that, you know, whoever was in charge of the territory was trying to get business for a specific thing, you know, three years ago. That doesn't impact us now. So I had a contract that, you know, they had a certain discount for print, 
but then you could add CourseMate for $10, you could add SAM for $25, you could add Applia for $15, you could add, um, you know, CNOW for $15. There are all these crazy different prices, and they weren't making use of any of it, and it also kind of seemed to be undervaluing some of our digital. So um, we're going to revise that to include MindTap and just make it all one flat price for digital to kind of simplify that. So if you look at your contracts, and um, if you have like a contract archive where you can kind of split up all the information that's in those contracts easily. Um, you can see, is there one that just doesn't make any sense? Uh, did we put an incentive in here that the school isn't using? And if so, then why aren't they using it and what can we what can we do that will actually work for them? Do you guys keep a running list of when your contracts are coming up for expiration? Do you know where we get that information from? To your EDS system? Julie Erkins. Julie. Yeah, Julie Ergens handled holds all of your contracts, and that's where they go back to when they get signed. But um, yeah, so my my point of this is be creative and don't think that something's just going to fit. And you know that you have to follow this out of the other. Be creative with your ideas. I mean, I know we were trying to be creative with Western Tech and trying to capture new business there with pricing. So I mean, our finance team will work with us. It just you've got to have some information for them, which is, I think is coming up the next slide. So working internally, this always seems to be the biggest question for everybody with contracts. Um, first and foremost, know what contracts you have in place. As we just mentioned, Julie Erkins. If you don't know, contact her. She is your best friend when it comes to contracts. She can pull those for you. Also, know what competitive contracts are at your schools. This is very important. So sometimes things are locked down for two or three years and we can't touch them. But still understand that you need to be relevant with the school, with that particular program that you're trying to go after. But when that contract's up, make sure you're ready to strike. And okay, Julie Rickens. Okay, so the who to call, PDs. You're gonna use them for, what, what three contracts you're gonna use for your PDs? Yes, yes. yes. Market share? Yes, got it. And then your manager needs to just move in, I guess, Anne and, uh, is it Melissa? Anne and Melissa. Just make sure that they're lived in the whole time because that conversation happens on those deal calls on Wednesdays. So here's the important piece, preparing for finance. Those who have worked with Bob know that Bob asks a lot of questions. And Bob wants a lot of information Bob is a numbers guy. So here is my piece of advice for you. Know your historical data. Know your trends. Know what your enrollments are at your school. Know what your uh, enrollment is for that particular program or whatever it is that you want to lock down. Um, know what units you're going after. What kind of length of contract that you want. What is that business model that you're trying to put together? When you get on a call and if you haven't done so, with Bob, those are the questions he's going to ask you. And as he's going through, your little calculator running in the background, or whatever he's doing, he's crunching numbers right there. So the more information that you can be prepared for, for uh, for Ann, for Bob, and even um, even with our curriculum service team, the more information that you can provide, the easier the process is, and um, you know, it just streams on, streamlines a lot of uh, phone calls, less conference calls. Makes me happy. <laughs> so, any questions on this? I just wanted to add to, I mean, like you said before, a lot of that does come to those kind of, you know, blunt questions. So, uh, for instance, I have a school where we're trying to get flat mind tap pricing. And we need to give it to them because we've got so many deans interested in it. We have to keep saying, we're going to get that pricing for you. We're going to get that pricing for you. We have internal discussions. Well, maybe $55 is too low. Maybe $65 is too much. You know, we're worrying, worrying internally whether they're going to say yes or no instead of just giving it to them or asking, hey, is $65 a good price for you? Which we ended up doing. And they're like, that's excellent. And then we were like, well, great, thank goodness we didn't pitch $55. You know, we were undercutting ourselves $10 per student. So sometimes, you know, I think we worry internally too much. Are they going to go for this or not? When you can say, you know, it's a discussion. You have to give them something to start, and then you can continue that discussion. Exactly. And especially then if those objections come back, then it allows you to have another conversation at the table. 
I mean, um, I use Concord a lot because, well, he's my biggest school, but we ran into this with curriculum where we get, we gave them, they told us what their price point needed to be, and we put together this beautiful presentation, and at the end of the day, we got pushback, and we couldn't figure out why, and just that bold sat across the table, and I said, why? Why? You know, where did you come, why were you at this at? Well, at this point in time, it's a financial problem because of uh, the fact that they are on, and I think we've talked about this before, the gainful employment, the HCM, HCM2. Mm. Well, they're at HCM1. And so therefore, they're, now their CFO is telling them, you have to get off the HCM1 before we can spend any money here. But if I wouldn't have gone in and just not been scared, I would have never have known and you know, been like, okay. So yeah, ask a lot of questions and uh, so be creative. Um, the last thing I was going to tell you on how these contracts work, it goes like this. So after your agreement, after you get your terms, and then the school says, yes, this is what we want to do, then that contract goes back to Bob and goes back to Vince to get written up. Bob Shuck has to sign it first. Then it goes out to your customer. Do not send that contract out without Bob's signature as number one. So make sure Bob signs first, and then when the school signs, you get the signed contract back, then it goes to Julie Erkins. So I know that was down and dirty because I missed so a quick. What questions you all have? Can I ask about the, sure. the guidelines and the discounting based on tier pricing? Is, there, yeah. is that based on like, you know, today's real reality versus, you know, year two reality when it comes to enrollments and units? That the percentage you have there yeah. is very close to where we are, to where we are today. Okay. Yes. So we're seeing we're, we are seeing you know two million dollars or. Pretty funny. But but we're we're seeing tiers that high and, and being able to offer them that kind of discount. Yes, okay. and anything on a tier, my recommendation is to take a look at where they're pacing about six months into the contract, so that way they know. Right. So that way there's no at the end of the year or anything where you tell them that they're seven hundred thousand dollars short so put that on put i always put that on something that i need to know because melissa will tell you i'm crunching numbers all day long so i know where i should start having those conversations if need be now are you making a point to get these people in, in person i mean is, is that is you want another negotiation is that high on your list like you think it's important to get in there and front of them and, and potentially a proposal along with the Contract. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we had our first initial conversation with VISTA, and um, so when that curriculum, when that contract is ready to go, if it's long and hairy, it will be something where I will jump on a plane and go sit down with uh, the CFO and have a conversation just to make sure the terms are all correct. And especially because I know sometimes with those cells that sometimes they are a little long, so I want to make sure that it's good. I wanted to bring up something about, you know, your pie contracts that have tiered pricing of the threshold. So, you know, like at a school, it could be if you bring in $800,000 or less, you're going to get a 40% discount. If you move up to over $800,000, you're going to get a 42% discount. I think a lot of us have seen this in our territories from the past. I have those thresholds in almost every contract, and they haven't been enforced in the past. So I guess um, if we could just have a brief discussion about strategy around, you know, you have a threshold. They should have... Their, their discount should have decreased, so we should be making more money. You know, you're making money less and less every year because we don't enforce that. How do we start to enforce that or just do a, a revision of the contract so that we can get back on track with them? Those conversations are happening now. Yeah. So just this past Friday, just the Sams had a conversation with Ann, and I think Ann and Bob have gone through the letters A, A through F on the contracts. And so there will be conversations that the SAMs now, and you guys should be brought in. And I don't know if Melissa and Bob have had those conversations yet, um, but they're happening at the SAM, at the, in the SAM zone, I guess I should say. So, and those are things like that that need to be brought up when those account reviews are taking place. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're seeing that, 
let your SAM know that and say, hey, I know here in the middle of contract account reviews right now with with uh, Ann and Bob, we need to re-strategize. Because right. if they're meeting at a different threshold somewhere in there, I mean, if it's a huge gap, yeah, by all means, those need to, those need to change. Yeah, because you might look at your contracts and see, you know, they started out, like I have school straight, it's my biggest school. Um, they started out at 50% discount, and they were supposed to be making us $8 million, okay? Well, they're only at $4 million, but they still get a 50% discount. Um, but you look at their, yeah, but you look at, you look at their, their contract and they don't have any room to grow. They can't get a larger than 50% discount. So what's the incentive for them to get more courses from us, right? So proposing, you know, changing that threshold to actually be more realistic where at they're at, you know, you know, if they're going to eventually it's $8 million, maybe that's not a 50% discount or maybe that's more like a 60% discount. They won't get there for a long time, but at least there's something for them to reach for. And we have to enforce those thresholds for it to mean anything. And, and to coat on what you're saying, and I know some of you in here have already heard my spiel on this. This is why understanding where your market share is by program at your school is so important for this conversation right here. So if you have that situation, then you're able to have that conversation with Ann, with John, with Debbie, with, with Melissa, with Bob, and say, listen, we're at this threshold at you know, $8 million, 50% off but we have nowhere to grow because we already know we have tapped it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is nothing market share wise we can go after. And that is why bringing all of this together is so vital. And these contract conversations internally, you, you just, you've got to know all the nook and cranny. And it's the same thing if, if flipping it around and having all that same information that you need to know for your customer to make sure it's the right agreement for two parties. And we're going to look this afternoon at your market share by program. So you have no way to learn how to do that. Yeah. And, yeah, the last thing I want to say, too, is, you know, we had some contracts, uh, like a pie that, that came up, I think, in September. And Sandy and I, I mean, we were new to all of our accounts. So we were like, you know, we need to learn more about this account before we do a revision and, and do it right. So we had to get all the information. You said all that background information to get Bob to kind of extend it out to January. So if you're really looking at these and all of a sudden you realize you've got you know, four of your school's contracts are coming up and you want to do all this back work to make sure that you're writing a contract that's going to work for them, you know, you might have some impetus there to be able to extend it until you can get that information. So, you know, if you realize you only have till the end of December and you haven't talked about it yet, maybe that's something you want to do. Yep, absolutely. And I know that was even in discussions on Friday. I think you were on the call on Friday. And where, if there needs to be a little bit of time, Bob will give us some time. Just make sure you have all your ducks in the row and the rational why. Not just because you want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, it really seems, I mean, the relationship building is a huge part of what goes into the contract. Yes. It's, it's knowing what your customer actually needs, so then you can tailor that contract to reflect those needs in it. Absolutely. And capitalize on the uh, market share there, potentially. So, and go back to what Abby was saying. You know, be blunt and don't ask them. You got to have that relationship first before you can kind of be blunt sometimes. Right. And if there's, you know, on the contracts that we talked about today, if you want copies or examples of something, I mean, I'm sure I can get my hands on a few. I've got tons of styles that I can share. I've got lots of tiered. I've got, um, I've got one at IntelliTech for market share play. So, I mean, I've got a lot of contracts. If anybody, you know, wants to take a look at them, I'm happy to put them up on the OneDrive. And just that way, if you haven't seen one before, I'm happy to share this out. So.